Hello! And before we get into this video, I would just like to let you know that this video is sponsored by Dashlane. Dashlane is the password manager app. It can autofill personal info, payment details, contact details, notes, and has a VPN so you can browse content anywhere without being tracked. Details leaked on the spooky dark web? Yeah. Dashlane will let you know right away. All you need to remember is one master password, and you're good to go. And it synchronizes to all your devices, so you can access your info everywhere, all the time. This is your one-stop shop for privacy and security online, and we all know how important that is these days. Head on over to dashlane.com chapter to get Dashlane on your first device and all premium features for the first 30 days. Then, if you want to upgrade to premium permanently, use my code CHAPTER to get 10% off. Thank you to Dashlane for sponsoring this video. Now let's get into it. Uh, I just need to, I don't need to know uh, what your verdict was, but I just need to know did all 12 jurors agree on that verdict? Yes, sir, we did. All right. Would you hand the verdict, please, to the court, to the clerk, please, excuse me. We all didn't agree on it. Sir? You said we all agreed on that verdict. We did. <laughs> Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this whole video I'm joined by Mr. Davis as we take a look at what happened to Jessica Chambers. Hey everyone, Mr. Davis here. I host my very own YouTube channel where I talk about true crime cases and cold cases from all around the world. And big thanks to Mike for having- Rad, but let's get into it. In 2014, 19 year old Jessica Chambers was found- ah shit, burning next to her car, which was also on fire. Not off to a great start. And before she would pass away, she gave first responders a name. This case has a huge amount of whodunitness, which we'll get into. So let's take a wander down to Cortland, Mississippi. Where we'll be spending uh, this video, so turn up the radiators and unleash the mosquitoes. It's a small town in northern Mississippi, population of about 500. Jessica Chambers was born in 1995 to parents Ben and Lisa, and she was a popular high school cheerleader. But Jessica had a tumultuous childhood. Her father pled guilty to manufacturing crystal meth and was arrested for driving under the influence in the early 2000s. Her neighbor was shot multiple times in his front yard in 2006. Her older brother died in a car accident in 2012. As a result, Jessica became a very tough woman. Jessica graduated from high school with all A's and B's and had recently started a new job selling clothes at a department store near Batesville. She, nonetheless, ran with a rough crown before her death. It's thought she may have made friends with the, the wrong people. So the uh, horrific incident occurred on December 6th, 2014. At 10 past 8 in the PM, 19-year-old Jessica Chambers was found in a wooded area not far from her mother's home. Jessica was burning and her car was on fire. She was burnt to a crisp but she was still alive. Fuck. She'd been left to stumble through the roadside ditch before she was spotted by a passing motorist who called 911. She had burned over 98% of her body. The blaze that engulfed her was so hot, it turned her black Kyrio white, incinerated her clothes, and blinded her. Jessica and her car were burning for about 30 minutes before emergency services got to her. Gasoline had been poured all over her body, down her throat, and even up her nose. One of the firefighters who arrived said he saw a silhouette of a person about 30 to 40 feet away. When the figure got closer, he realized it was a woman with frayed hair and no clothing. He described Jessica as dazed and had trouble walking. This particular firefighter had actually gone to school with Jessica, but admitted he was unable to identify her due to the burns that covered her body. And as they reached her, she allegedly said, Eric set me on fire, though another responder said it could have been Derek that had done this. 
She would pass away the next day from her injuries in a Memphis hospital, holding her mother's hand. So who could have done something just this absolutely horrific? A 19-year-old woman doused in lighter fluid and then set on fire. Her family distraught as investigators try to put the tragedy aside and find the people responsible. WMC Action News 5's Lauren Squires has the story. The burned car is being stored here at the Panola County Jail in this lot. The car with the blue tarp over the top, it will be used as evidence when someone is arrested. Meantime, friends and family are still trying to cope with the loss of 19-year-old Jessica Chambers. Charred grass, tire marks, and crime tape lined the road in Cortland, Mississippi Sunday afternoon. She was a good girl. She was. The aftermath of a deadly scene Saturday night after Panola County deputies were called to a burning car. They found 19-year-old Jessica Chambers burned too. She was taken to Regional 1 in Memphis where she later died. The Panola County DA confirms that Chambers' father was an employee in the Sheriff's Department. Sunday afternoon, her uncle stopped by the scene shortly after investigators left. He and so many others are still trying to understand what happened. But I had to, I had to see. He was relatively speechless and says family members are having a hard time. According to investigators, Chambers may have been doused in gasoline and then set on fire. These are photos of her car after it was towed from the scene. People do, do bad things mm -hmm. to, to good people. Meantime, people who live in the small communities of Panola County are still trying to understand what happened and why. It's shocking. Never, I never dreamed anything like that would happen around here. I don't know how to process it, really, to tell you the truth. All the while, hoping and praying investigators find out who committed this horrible crime. They don't got to get them. Whoever did this will get caught and they'll go to jail for it. No one has been officially charged in this case so far, but they are treating it as a homicide case, and we can't expect much more come Monday morning. In Jessica's car keys were found along the road near the scene of the crime. Her cell phone was examined to see if they could, well, track her movements and see what led to what the shit happened. She'd spent that morning with her friends, then went to her mom's house to take a nap, and in the afternoon she received a text from someone. She told her mother that she was going to get something to eat and clean out her car, leaving at about 5 p.m. At around 5.30, she went to a gas station about a mile and a half from where her body was found and put $14 worth of gas in the car. This was the last time she was seen before what happened. Location data from her phone showed that she went to nearby Batesville at around 6 p.m., which is only around five miles away, but then returned to Cortland at around 6.30 p.m. It is not known what she was doing in Batesville. Around 15 minutes later, she called her mother. Her mother noticed that it was unusually quiet. At 7.30 p.m., she drove to the area where she was found half an hour later. Nearly everyone in the area with the name Eric or Derek was questioned and ruled out. Her boyfriend, Travis Sanford, was also questioned and ruled out as he was in jail at the time. They also questioned convicted drug dealers who might have a connection to her. Jessica herself had expressed concerns involving her friends to her father, who worked as a mechanic for the county sheriff's office. The last six weeks before she died, she told him 10 or 15 times, everybody thinks I'm snitching because you work for the police. Investigators would ask the public to come forward with any information in this case, anything they knew about what led to Jessica's death. A $54,000 reward would end up being offered in this case, with the police interviewing about 150 people. In February of 2016, 27-year-old Quentin Tellis from Cortland, Mississippi was indicted on a capital murder charge in Jessica's death. He had prior convictions for burglary, drug possession, and fleeing from police. And you know, I, I hope uh, the, he gets what the law allows, you know. Death penalty, that's fine, whatever, you know. Whatever he gets, he deserves. And you know, and I, and I feel sorry for his family. His family got to go through a lot of, lot, lot of problems, you know. He's not only destroyed our family, he's hurt his family, you know. And you know, and then, God bless everybody, you know, they just... She's got to have justice. That doesn't come until the conviction. That, that's when justice comes. 
I'm overwhelmed, you know. I'm overwhelmed, you know. They said they would never stop. They never did. I was glad. But then I got even a little bit gladder when I heard they was indicted by her. He was, is a gang member with a rap sheet who had served time previously, but it's not thought that his, uh, his gang and drug affiliations had anything to do with, uh, well, what happened to Jessica. And get this, he is a killer. Maybe, but at least he, at the very least, he's heavily linked to a murder. He had been arrested in 2015 for the murder of another woman, Ming Chen Hiseo, a 34-year-old University of Louisiana Monroe student from Taiwan, whose debit card he was caught using after her death. See, eight months after Jessica's horrific death, he had a meeting with a probation officer that he didn't attend. Shortly afterward, he married Jaquita Jackson, and the two moved together to Monroe, Louisiana. Police say Quentin and Mean Chen were last seen together on a Walmart security video. A neighbor gave authorities a license plate number of a man who gave her a creepy feeling. That man, later identified as Quinton, had later been to Mi Ying Chen's apartment, and they were said. She had heard the two arguing. A few days later, Mi Ying Chen Haseo went missing. Her body was found ten days later in her apartment. She'd been stabbed several times, and her debit card was missing. Shortly after, someone had called the customer service number that is listed on every debit card issued by the bank and had asked for help to access the balance and personal identification number. The number that made the call was linked to a certain Quinton Tellus. He admitted to using the card, pled not guilty to the, the murder. The trial for that one, well, it's, it's on hold until Jessica Chambers' case is resolved. So, head investigators connect Quinton Tellus to Jessica Chambers burning alive. Well, I'll tell you how they did it. They did it through using the old phone. Text records, surveillance, location data, all that shit. The two had known each other for a few weeks and were allegedly romantically involved. He was also the last person who texted her before her death. Her... just fucking horrific death. Hmm, 7.30pm. I, uh, I think something important happened around that time. Maybe? However, when told this, he did the old alibi switcheroo and said he was with her until 7pm and then he left. And that uh, a friend of his, Big Mike, no, not me, not me, had come, picked him up and then they spent the night together, him and his buddy. However, when authorities questioned Big Mike, he said that he had gone to a football game in Nashville that night. Nowhere near Quinton Tellus. His attendance at the game was confirmed, disproving Quinton's alibi. And when police were uh, easily able to disprove this lie, he told another tall tale. He said that Jessica picked him up that night and the two went to a Taco Bell in Batesville. He claimed that the two of them went back to his house and sat in his driveway listening to music. He claimed that she left his driveway at 7pm, 30 minutes before she was set on fire. However, her phone's location data and surveillance video from a gas station next to his home indicated that she left at 7.30 p.m. and drove to the area where she was later found on fire. I mean, if you're gonna lie, try not to do it shittily and in ways that's easily disprovable. I and mean, come on, come on. So the police put on their thinking caps and said, hmm, what are the odds that, you know, Jessica would have left the house, driven to this wooded area and maybe met somebody there who would have set her on fire? What are the odds of that? I'm not a gambling man, but I don't think it's wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't roll the dice on that one. Remember her little dots are all right there? That's where you're at. That's where you're from. I promise. And what, and what the, uh, there you go. March 6, 17. You see that, okay. you're, you're, see that line right there? It's 6, 17, where I'm at. You were right there with Jessica. I promise and what? you. You know what's bad is I want to believe you. As a person, a person, man to man, I want to believe you. But because of everything we know, I'm sorry, man. I just don't. I won't no, believe it. I'm not told the truth. How do you explain y'all being together at 7:55 p.m. down there, where there's nothing else? Where she, you know, where she was burned, don't you? What else is down there, Quinn? 
They ain't nothing. There's, they ain't no houses. They ain't no nothing, man. They ain't nothing down there where she, that girl was found. That, 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 that's it. And, you know, and if there was something close that you could say, oh, yeah, but I was at his house. They'd give you an out. But there ain't no house down there, man. There ain't no house within a mile of where she was burning quit. Unless you stand, you know, I guess you come off and say, I took a, I took a ride on my, maybe, it, did you take a ride on your motorcycle and end up down there close? That'd be the only, I mean, there's got to be a reasonable explanation. If you weren't with her, you'd be close. But because I'm telling you what the records say. It's not what I say or Paul says. It's those dang cell phone records that put y'all's phones close together. And there's just nothing down there. I mean, it just ain't nothing else down there. A sample of his DNA was taken, which was found to match DNA taken from Jessica's found car keys. It was discovered that her keys were found along a path between the crime scene and his sister's home. Whoa. Surveillance video showed a vehicle, believed to be his sister's, stopping briefly at his home at 7.50pm before driving towards the crime scene. Surveillance video also helped show that Quinton had changed his clothes three times. That day. When the police got a hold of Quentin's phone, they found that within an hour of Jessica's death, he had deleted all communications with her from his phone and stopped checking on her, even though they had been in constant contact in the days prior. The deleted messages showed that the week prior to her death, he repeatedly asked to have sex with her. Each time, she denied his request. The messages also show that she had denied him sex four times on the day of her death. Fucking hell, how many times did he have to ask? So, Quinton was indicted on these charges in February 2016. Quinton pled, not guilty. And then, over the course of the year, the first trial would begin. Yes, first trial would begin. Prosecutors believe that while in Quinton's driveway, he tried to have sex with her. However, she resisted. Then he became enraged and suffocated her until she was unconscious. In order to distance himself from the crime, he then drove her car to the area where it was later found. He then ran on foot to his sister's home nearby, took her car, picked up gasoline from his home, and then returned to Jessica's car and set it on fire with her inside. He believed she was already dead. What went from a car fire and a tree farm to a vehicle on fire with a female severely burned and in the, in the road as well. And what did you find upon your arrival at the scene? No. I found Jessica standing initially and they, you know, I told them as the EMR, you know, we needed to get a blanket around there. Somebody, they told me if somebody's going for a blanket, I went for my turnout jacket. We put the blanket around there, and I put my turnout jacket over. Uh, and we laid her down near the, near the fire truck. Describe for the jury the assessment that you were making of Jessica and what you observed about her, about her when you first began to look at her. Walking on the scene, uh, she was standing, I could see, you know, the back, her back, high first degree burn some second. Uh, laying her down whenever I started to talk to her. I mean, because EMR, there's not a whole lot that could have been done from my standpoint. Talking was the best way to judge airways, breathing, and things like that, as well as comforter. I asked, I said, baby girl, you know, who done this to you? Did she respond? Yes, sir. What did she say? She said, Eric. Okay. And how would you describe the distress that she was in? She was a fighter. I mean, she she was trying to answer questions. I mean, she was trying to tell us, you know, who she was. I mean, pretty outstanding if you ask me. The defense claimed that the person whom Jessica identified as Eric or Derek was the real killer. 
Quinton told police that a sex offender named Derek Holmes was stalking Jessica. Residents claimed to have seen the two together. However, he was ruled out by investigators based on his alibi. He was at home at the time of the murder, and they had several interviews with him. He was definitely at home. Furthermore, doctors and other experts noted that it would have been difficult for her to say anything properly due to the injuries to her mouth and throat. For example, when the emergency services arrived, she said her name was Yombers, as in Chambers. She couldn't say it properly. Jessica also did not use her phone to talk to anyone named Eric or Derek in the 30 days prior to her death. The prosecutor would say, you know, due to the burning damage, her lips burnt, swollen tongue, cheeks, just all burnt out, she wouldn't have been able to pronounce the letter T. So maybe she was trying to say, tell us, as in Quinton tell us, not Eric. Maybe that's what it was. Or maybe the prosecution was just laser focused on Quinton. Now in November 2016, when the trial was drawing to a close, things turned into a bit of a farce. They became farcical. So initially, when the jurors returned their verdict, it was read as not guilty. Okay, they didn't think he had done it. But then they said to the judge, it's not unanimous. The judge says, it has to be unanimous. And it turned out that some of the jury misunderstood the instructions and had actually voted guilty. All right, if you bring the jury in, please. Uh, I've been told that the jury's reached a verdict. Is that correct? Uh, did you all select a foreman? Uh, all right, sir. Let's see. Mr. Lampkin, is that correct? That is correct. All right. Uh, I just need to, I don't need to know uh, what your verdict was, but I just need to know, did all 12 jurors agree on that verdict? Yes, sir, we did. All right. Would you hand the verdict, please, to the court, to the clerk, please, excuse me. We all didn't agree on it. Sir? You said we all agreed on that verdict. We did. All 12. Verdict has to be unanimous. So all 12 did not agree on the verdict. Is that what you're telling me, sir? Yeah, I can agree. All right. I'll ask you to step back into the jury room, please. Pass the, pass the verdict, please, to the clerk that you have in your hand. Give them the jury instruction back. An hour later, the jury returned and said they couldn't reach a verdict. They were deadlocked. A mistrial was declared and a new trial began in September 2018. However, during that trial, a mistrial was again declared. Tried twice for the murder of Jessica Chambers, but both trials ended in a hung jury. And that was and has many wondering if Quentin Tellis will be tried for a third time. Local 24 News reporter Tish Clark live in the studio now with new information from the district attorney on this very case. Tish. Hi, Katina. Well, Quentin Tellis will go back to Monroe, Louisiana sometime this week. He'll face murder charges down there for killing a college exchange student in July 2015. Investigators say the student was tortured before she was stabbed nearly 30 times in her apartment. Tellis denies killing the student. However, he pleaded guilty to using her debit card and was sentenced to 10 years as a habitual offender. Tellis was then extradited here to Mississippi to face murder charges in the Jessica Chambers case. As for the Chambers case, District Attorney John Champion says he might take Tellis to trial a third time, but he wants to let emotions simmer down a little bit in Panola County, and he wants to talk to the Chambers family before making any decisions. Prosecutors are deciding whether to retry Quinton a third time for the murder. He still faces murder charges and the death of Ming Chen Haseo. It looks like there will in fact be a third trial, but not for some time yet. So put the kettle on, keep on waiting. Quinton Tellis is currently serving a 10-year sentence in the Uachita Correctional Center in Monroe for the, you know, the debit card theft. Due for release in 2025, though it seems the trial for Mi Ying Chen might go ahead before the third Jessica Chambers trial. If convicted of Jessica's murder, he will face life in prison, no parole. And he continues to maintain his innocence. So what do you think about this case? I mean, for me, personally, uh, I think it's pretty heavy that he probably did do it. I mean, not counting the Eric Derek thing. There's so much more other evidence that's like, well, 
you were the only person there. There's a lot of data that's saying you probably were involved in it. But let me know what you guys think. And finally, thank you so, so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. I gotta give a special thank you to old Mr. Davis for joining me in this video. His uh, channel, you know, it's, it's true crime and stuff, so if you like this, you'll love that. Go check it out, and I mean now. Thanks again. Thanks for watching, everyone. Take care of yourself, take care of each other, and as always, stay safe out there. What he said. I'll see you as always real soon in the next video. Mike out.